We're born into this world that has so much aging, illness, death. It's all around us. We look inside us. It's everywhere. The question is, what are we going to allow these things to take away from us, and what can we hold on to in spite of them? We're talking today about one of the necessary skills in negotiating, which is having a very clear sense of what you don't want to give away at all, and a willingness to let go of other things so you can hold on to that thing that's most precious. And so in this massive body and mind that we call us, what's there to hold on to? Well, the Buddha says, the qualities of the path. You have your actions, those go with you, the results of your actions. So you want to hold on to that principle, that you're going to try to do what is skillful. And it starts from the outside and goes on the inside. And let go of things that are not. And have a clear sense of the things that you hold on to that will get in the way of holding on to good things. Those are things you've got to learn how to let go. So you're negotiating with death, basically. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha says in terms of virtue, Loss in terms of your health, loss in terms of your relatives, loss in terms of your wealth don't really that matter that much. But loss in terms of your virtue and your right view, that matters a lot. So that's something you want to hold on to. And even before death comes, we're negotiating a lot about how we find our happiness in the world. And a lot of the problem comes from the fact that we tend to glom things together. You gain some happiness from a particular relationship, while well, you figure out that's what happiness has to depend on, is that relationship. Then it ends. And then you pull the pieces together again, and then you look for another relationship. Remember, it says you've got to learn how to unglom these things. The mind has this tendency to glom these things together. Because partly because we're ignorant, partly because we're hungry. And it's through the force of hunger, through the force of pain, that we just grab onto whatever we can, put things together in whatever way. It seems to make sense. So we can keep on going. But in the process of that, we've glommed a lot of things together that are a mixture of good and bad. They don't really have to be together. This is why the Buddha has us analyze things. You glom your happiness out of what you sense around the body. Well, he says, well, take that apart. What in the body is there worth holding on to? That would make you do something unskillful. So take the body apart in terms of the 32 parts, or whatever, however many parts you want to see that the body itself is not of any essential worth. It's worth while in the good that we can do with it. But in and of itself, it's not that much. Similarly with the mind, he has us take things apart. Like the five aggregates, it seems to be a, a strange way of dividing up the pie. You've got form, which is the body, feelings, are your feelings of pleasure or pain, neither pleasure nor pain? Perceptions, the labels you place on things. Fabrications, which are all the things you put together in the mind to make thoughts that make sense. And then consciousness. Prior to the Buddha's time, these various concepts were floating around in India, but he was the one who put them together as a set and said, it's out of this set that we create our sense of who we are. And as long as we identify with these things, we're going to suffer. And not only that, we're going to do things that are unskillful in our attempt to hang on to them. The question comes up, why did he choose these five categories? There's lots of other ways you can divide up the processes of the mind, say. 
And the answer seems to be that these are the processes that go into the activity of feeding. You've got the body here that you want to maintain, and then there's the forum of the things out there you want to feed on, or you could, could feed on. The feeling of hunger that drives you to, to feed, and the feeling of satisfaction that comes after you've fed. Your perceptions, on the one hand, perceiving what kind of hunger you've got. Are you hungry for salt, hungry for sugar, hungry for water? Hungry for something light, something heavier. And then that goes into mental hungers. So what does the mind feel the need for right now? And fabrication, which is the process of finding what you want, what you've identified as the proper food for, to feed that hunger, and then what you've got to do to fix it so you can actually digest it. <coughs> you get a raw potato, what do you do with it? You can actually eat it. That's fabrication. And then finally, consciousness, your awareness of all these things. And these are the activities that are basic to the most basic activity we do, feeding. And it's around these activities that we create our sense of self. And so when your sense of self is getting in the way, it's good to take it apart. See exactly where are you identifying with something that's going to make you do something unskillful. So even though the categories may seem a little strange, they actually have a use, they have a purpose. It's very rare that the Buddha simply takes categories from his culture and imposes them on the Dharma. He said, when they're useful, he'll take them. And he lists them in ways that are really helpful. The same with the four frames of reference that we practice in establishing mindfulness. The body, feelings, mind, mental qualities. Feeling there is, is one of the, the difficult ones, because the word in, feeling in English has lots of meanings. You, you feel your body, and you also feel pleasure and pain, and also you feel sadness or joy or whatever. So you've got three kinds of feeling. Just feeling the presence of the body, feelings of pleasure and pain, and then your emotions. And what the Buddha is talking about here is the second one, feelings of pleasure and pain. Your sense of the body says it's actually something else. And that's a very useful distinction to make right there. You sit here and pain comes up in part of the body and immediately glom the physical side of your sense of the body, which is basically comes down to properties of solidity, warmth, coolness, energy. You glom that together with the pain, so the pain is there in your body. It's invaded you. And you can get all worked up about it. But if you can see the actual feelings of pleasure and pain are one thing, and the warmth of the body and the solidity of the body and the energy are two different things. On the one hand, when you breathe in and breathe out, this will immediately have an impact. Because all too often there's this sense inside that when you breathe in, the energy of the breath can go up to a pain, but then it has to stop. The pain is a wall. And just that perception right there creates a lot of unnecessary pain. You tense up around the pain. Or if you can hold the perception, the breath energy can go through. The breathing is a different process. And allowing the breath to go through can also often work through any unnecessary tension you build up around the pain. But even deeper you begin to see that the Pain is one thing, and the breath is something else, and even though they're in the same space, they're in different frequencies or different levels. And you realize, because the pain is not invading you. You're the one who's invading the pain. You've taken it on, made it part of your identity, and then you're trying to push it out. But if you can actually see distinctly, okay, this is a pain sensation, and these are in the Buddha's terms, earth for solidity, water for liquidity, or coolness, fire for warmth, breath for energy. 
if it's just earth or water or fire or energy. That's one kind of sensation. The pain is another kind of sensation. You can see them as distinct. You don't have to suffer from the pain nearly as much as you would otherwise. And then you begin to see exactly what's going on in the pain. You can start taking it apart. The big pain monster suddenly becomes just little bits and pieces of things. That's not so scary, after all. And when it's not so scary, it pains you a lot less. So there's a two of two of the frames of reference, the other two are mind and mental qualities. Again, this may seem an arbitrary way of defining dividing up the pie. But it's useful. The mind, you can think of it as the entire committee of the mind has made a decision. It's on the side of greed or it's on the side of anger. Or it's on the opposite side. Or you're trying to get the mind to settle down, either it's concentrated or it's not. And when it's not concentrated, it might be because it's too energetic, too scattered, or too depressed. We're not just left there with those states of mind. This is what the mental qualities are for. Once you figure out you've got some imbalance going on or something unskillful going on, you want to take it apart. See what's going in to make that up. And you see it's made up of these mental qualities. There might be the five hindrances. Or it might be a sense of clinging to something that comes up in terms of what you've seen or heard or smelled or tasted, felt, cognized with the mind. When you can divide, when you can analyze what's going on in these terms, then you know what to do. Some I mean, of those frames of reference that it gives for metal qualities. You've got the hindrances, okay, once you recognize that something is a hindrance in the mind. And you remember what to do. The Buddha has all these instructions for how to abandon that particular hindrance. All too often the hindrance comes in, we don't see it as a hindrance, we just see it as part of us. Let's say if there's desire, okay, the object that you're focused on really is desirable. Even if someone else were to look in on your fantasies about what's desirable and say, good grief, how could you desire that? But you're not thinking in those terms. You just think about how much it really is desirable. Well, the Buddha helps you to step back and have that kind of good grief moment. The same with anger or ill will. Even sleepiness. Step back from that a little bit. What's it made up out of? Sometimes it's just certain, a certain pattern of sensations in the body that you've learned to interpret as, ah, the sign that the mind is tired, the body's tired, it's time to rest. I'll just take it apart in terms of those sensations. You see that it's not nearly as overpowering as you might have thought. There are times, of course, when you really are sleeping, but the mind has a tendency to play that trick on itself. Either when you're bored or something's coming up in the mind that you don't want to face, you suddenly get drowsy. But don't just take that as the diagnosis. Step back a bit and say, okay, are you really drowsy or are you playing tricks? Learn how to test it. So if a series of thoughts comes up in the mind that are really compelling, try to take them apart and say, okay, what in here is an attachment to a sight, and what in here is an attachment to a sound, and what is an attachment to a taste, or a smell, or a feeling in the body, or to a thought you've had? In other words, take it apart in terms of the, the sixth sense media. That's another one of the frames of reference that the Buddha offers. In, this category of mental qualities. As for good things, when concentration arises, when mindfulness arises, you don't just sit there and watch it arise and then go. You try to develop good things. These things fall under the factors for awakening. When the mind has a problem and you're analyzing and you seem to be getting someplace, okay, that's analysis of qualities. That's something to be encouraged. Not all thinking is to be discouraged while you're meditating. When you're actually seeing that something is skillful or something is unskillful, and you've got beginning to get a handle on how to develop what's skillful and abandon what's not, okay, pursue that line of thinking until it's done its job, or until you find that it's not making sense anymore. That's when you go back to the concentration. 
But when these things arise in the mind, you have to learn to recognize that oh, these are on the skillful side. And then think of all the teachings you learn about how you develop what's skillful in the mind. So these modes of analysis for unglomming things in the mind are for there for you to get a handle on things so you can learn how to use them for the sake of release. And there's so many ways that you can analyze reality that would not lead to release. And those analyses may be true on their level. But if they tie the mind down, why get involved in them? You use them when they're appropriate. And then you put them aside. What we're working on now is the question of how to divide up your sense of your body and mind so you can find release. And you can figure out what in here is worth holding on to and what's worth letting go. This is part of our negotiation. We're negotiating with, we're negotiating with aging, illness, and death. Figuring out what's worth holding on to, what we can give away to them. And there are a lot of things they're going to take willy nilly, but there are things that, if we know how to hold on properly, we can keep. For instance, some people, when they start thinking about death, they say, well, what the hell? I'm just going to do what I want. As long as everything, everything's going to die anyhow. You've handed all your treasures over to death. The proper way to think is, Certain qualities of the mind will go with me after I die. Certain habits will go with me. Whatever way my thinking is inclined right now, that's going to be the inclination of how I go. So incline things in the right direction. Let go of things that will pull you back in the wrong directions. This is how you master the art of the deal. How to negotiate with aging, illness, and death and come out winning. <laughs>